Good evening, everyone. My name is Thane Rosenbaum. I'm the creative director of the Forum on Life, Culture, and Society at Turo College. And welcome to the Folks Film Series. Tonight's film, the documentary, A Crime on the Bayou. It's directed by my good friend, Nancy Bursky, who is a, a, an esteemed documentary filmmaker and a, and a good friend. Uh, and the film uh, tells the story of uh, Gary Duncan, uh, who uh, at the age of 20 uh, in, in New Orleans, shortly after the beginning of uh, uh, the desegregation of schools, uh, the passage of the Civil Rights Act and the passage of the Voting Rights Act, uh, was driving home and saw outside a school uh, his nephew and uh, a cousin, and it looked like there was going to be a sort of a school post school fight with some white boys. So he got out of the car to try to defuse whatever that might be, and he did it successfully. And he pulled the boys away, and there was no fighting. And then, as a gesture to say goodbye, to say, Look, he even had to endure a racial slur, he touched one of the boys on the arms to say, Hey, take care, we'll, we'll see you someday. And that night, he was arrested for uh, assaulting a minor. Uh, a third degree battery. Uh, and the case lingered for two years. He was on bail, he was in prison, he was in and out. And it's the film is very much about a buddy story between him uh, and uh, the lawyer, uh, a, a white Jewish lawyer who had been in New Orleans uh, and it, along with other civil rights lawyers in the deep south. And we'll talk about that as well, uh, Richard Sobel. And uh, in a, after two years, the case went all the way to the Supreme Court uh, and, 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 and Gary won. And in fact, it was a seven to do decision. And in fact, it changed the law. It, it required that even in state law actions, state court criminal cases, even with misdemeanors uh, under two years of prison time, uh, the defendant is still entitled to a sixth amendment right to a jury. And that was not the law before uh, that he'd essentially received an unfair trial because he wasn't given uh, a, a jury. And so uh, when you think of James Meredith, when you think of Rosa Parks, uh, you should also think of Gary Duncan. Uh, he in his, in his own way is very much a civil rights icon. Uh, and so, uh, so tonight joining us for the film uh, with of course is Nancy the director, Gary Duncan is here as well. Armand uh, Durfner is here too. He was one of the lawyers who was working in Mississippi during this period of time. This is a way to think about the lawyers that all came down uh, during Freedom Summer in the mid 1960s and worked to get people who were arrested for their civil rights work out of jail. Uh, and lastly, and thank God he just arrived, uh, Lowless Eric Ellie, who is a, a, a well-known writer, uh, author, uh, journalist, columnist, filmmaker, uh, and his own family story is tied up in this as well. And he's just joined us as well. Uh, before we get to this uh, conversation, if you uh, are uh, an attorney getting a CLE credit, I know some of you are, uh, make sure that you fill out the form uh, at the end of the evening then in order for you to get the credit. Uh, if you're joining us on Facebook Live, welcome. We love that you're here. Our audience continues to grow on Facebook Live. Uh, come on folks.org as well and give us your fill, uh, email address so you can get uh, direct invitations uh, to folks events. Um, and if you have a question for either Nancy or Gary or Amarn or uh, Lolis, uh, you should uh, leave it in the Q&A box and hopefully we'll have some time at the end. So uh, welcome uh, all of you. Uh, thank you for joining us. Nancy, this is really a, a, a true achievement. Uh, I won't tell everybody how long you and I known each other, but we, the one time I actually got to make a film. I made a, I was a co-producer on a film that Nancy directed uh, and wrote and also co-produced. So I have, I'm bound to Nancy for life. <laughs> uh, and by the way, that film was about Sidney Lumet. It was a Ma American masters film uh, on Sidney Lumet who has a long association with folks. He was a guest here uh, three times. Uh, and one of these days, Nancy, as we discussed, will probably show uh, the film as part of the Folks Film Series, and we'll have you back. So Nancy, this is um, the third uh, the, uh, in what became a trilogy. I don't know if it's being called the Nancy Bursky Civil Rights Trilogy, mm -hmm. but it should be because you, no. you know, you wrote, you wrote, you did a film on uh, Virgi uh, Loving versus Virginia, which the, the Loving case, which was the 
Supreme Court case that essentially granted a right uh, to biracial marriages uh, as a right to privacy under the Constitution. And you did another film on the rape of Reese uh, Taylor. And then your third film um, is this film on uh, Gary Duncan. Why Gary? Uh, why was this third? What was, was this, how did you come to be introduced to this story? What made this a particularly good story for a Nancy Bursky documentary? <laughs> Well, first of all, the trilogy certainly will not have my name on it. <laughs> One of the things that I, I feel so strongly about in, in all of these stories is giving these individuals, whether they are, you know, in, in Gary's case, I'm so happy that he's he's here to be able to tell his story and not only tell the story, but but discuss the meaning of the story. Um, the, the, all three films um, give a platform to these individuals who stood up for their rights. These are individuals who were not activists, they were not setting out to change history, but by standing up for the principle of doing the right thing, the moral thing, um, standing up against corrupt forces, they change history. And, and that's what ties these three films together. Um, so these are their films, not my films. And um, there are other themes that, that thread their way through these films, the other themes that thread their way through the films as well. And one of them is the law. Um, yeah. and, and that's, I'm sure, why we're here, and we're very grateful to be here with you, Thane. But the, the idea that we're looking at the law and the rule, the, the role that law plays in these stories is is a, is a pretty powerful one. Um, and I'm not sure ever, you know, we we do that enough these days. Recognize how critical the law is to people's rights. Well, Gary, let's let's go to you then. Um... I mean, I could ask you, I will, you know, do you feel like a hero? I, I built you up. I think of you that way. Uh, I, you eventually became a leader of the community. I suspect some of that has to do with the, the heroism and the recognition of that case that went to the Supreme Court. But I think the audience should know, since only 100 of them actually got a chance to see the film. By the way, this is a wonderful film, and you can watch it on various different streaming platforms on YouTube, uh, Apple TV, Amazon Prime, please. This conversation is gonna be riveting, but the film itself is something one must watch. So Gary, I think we should just start off by saying you could have taken the easy route. You didn't have to fight this. Uh, you probably would have been offered some kind of a deal. Uh, my, if I remember in the film, your mom wouldn't let that happen, right? There, there's some principle here with the Duncans that they were not gonna let this stand, right? All right. You know, uh... I thank God for uh, for my my mother and my family, and my mother was a strong-willed woman, and she she was more she had more wisdom about the racist thing that was going on. And she, and and she knew. Remember, she you were just twenty about, years old at the time, right? You were very uh, young. I just I just had uh, I just had turned uh, nineteen. Nineteen. Right, and um. Uh, well, I was gonna take the easy route off because I was gonna. I figure, hey, I go plead, and I, I plead guilty, and that'll have been it. Pay a fine and go on. But with the wisdom my mother had, and she knew what all went on in the past, she wasn't gonna let that happen. So, and after that happened, well, uh, and I really seen what was was hap what was happening. Well. Uh, I sort of stepped up to the plate. Now, for me being a uh, a leader in the community, we had a, uh, I was a fisherman. I used to trawl for swells. And uh, they came out with the TED, the turtle excluder. And I guess I just had a big mouth bowl and I spoke what I had on my mind. And I guess people recognized me by that. So, so I, let's go back to what you just said a moment ago. Your mother wouldn't let you quit, but in the film, you know, you're you're very emotionally raw. It's very beautiful to watch you recall the story. And I guess one question is, you know, it took two years. Were there moments in time that you wond wondered, was is this worth it? Is it worth going through this? You'd go back to prison, you'd come out of prison. You know, as you said, you could have taken a deal. This thing would have been over very quickly. Uh, did you waver or was it to require your mother to say, keep pushing you? Or did you yourself decide, I don't care what this takes, I'm going to stick with this case, even if it goes all the way to the Supreme Court? 
you know, my mother spoke some strong words and uh, she had asked me if I actually hit uh, Landry and I told her no. And she, she said, well, she would walk the street buck naked before she, she <laughs> may spend a day in jail. So, hey, that was a lot of, uh, a lot of courage, you know, that would make you feel like uh, you could uh, fight the world. Right. And, uh, and then my eye was open about what was going on. So uh, I, I wasn't about to give up. I mean, uh, the last time they took me to, uh, to jail was three o'clock in the morning. And uh, they called me from offshore. Well, I, I kind of lost it then because I refused to go to jail. I said, well, that's it. Uh, I was ready to just die right there because I got tired going to jail. Yeah. But uh, again, thank all for my family. Uh, my brother Calvin, he kept, he was like a, a, a moderator back and forward talking to the deputies. And, and I thank all for the two deputies because they could have had, you know, called in to, uh, to the office and said, well, he refused it all to come out. And, well, it could have been yeah. a big scene. So I thank all for them. And, you know, yeah. Uh, so, but anyway. All right. So, Ar Armand, uh, you know, for some people who pretty much everyone who's watching knows uh, the, the story of the, the, the role that the lawyers played. And Nancy introduced this idea as well. Like the law is something that is threaded through this movie. Um, you hear the heroism in, in Gary. You know, you were among a number, were there hundreds? I mean, what was the number of people who ended up coming to the South uh, in the mid 1960s? Some of them just stayed for three weeks at a time, right? The movie makes it clear that some of them came during their vacations and simply spent three weeks. Uh, and it was a number of different organizations, including your organization, which was the Lawyers Constitutional, what was it? Defense <laughs> Committee, right? And then there was the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Right. Can you take us back to what was it like to be, I assume you were just out of law school. Everybody was just out of law school. There was, must have been a, an enormous sense of spirit to say, I'm going to go to the Deep South. I know that some people might get their heads clubbed in, uh, but I'm going to go uh, and be part of it. Can you take us back there? It was, it was that kind of a heady time. You have to remember, in those days, um, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, a lot of those places, especially where Gary lived, were really medieval places. And in fact, when I was watching the movie, it, it, the fact that the sun was shining struck me because I always had an image then, and I have an image now, that the place was dark, <laughs> shadowy, um, medieval. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and the sun shining was a little bit out of kilter. But lawyers, as you say, in the hundreds came, many for short times. Uh, and then there were some staff lawyers. Dick Sobel, who was Gary's lawyer, came first as a volunteer for a few weeks on vacation, uh, thought he'd never come back. Uh, I came the same way and was uh, sent to Mississippi. And then eventually, Dick uh, became a staff lawyer full time, permanent role. For several but years. when you went down, did you think there was going to be, did you feel like it was a medieval meant dangerous for yes. you? Yes, yes, I did. Uh, before I went, I checked my passport. Um, I checked with the local FBI, told them I was going. And I will say this, uh, <clears throat> I had occasion after I'd been there for about two or three days to go to the airport and check something at the Delta ticket counter. They didn't know who I was. I didn't, you know, I, I didn't look any different from any normal person. And when I went up to the counter, the man said, hello, Mr. Durfner. Wow. The notion that he knew who I was and that they were watching us every minute. We never yeah. lost that fear. By the way, I'm just curious. I don't know of this. I hope the answer is no. But uh, unlike the three civil rights workers that were killed in Neshoba County, uh, Mississippi. Some people remember that they were memorialized in the Gene Hackman film. Uh, what was it? Uh, something of Mississippi, Mississippi, Mississippi burning, of course. Uh, do we have any, I know, and of course, anyone who sees videos of Selma or Montgomery, we know that people were, you know, freedom riders had their heads clubbed in. 
Do we know of lawyers? We know that Richard in this case, and we'll talk about him soon, was arrested. But right. do, we, do we have any story of lawyers? Yes, being arrested is one thing, but clubbed, anyone killed? No, no, but I was shot at. <laughs> you were uh, shot at? We were, my wife, my then wife, my late wife, and I were driving up um, the highway in Mississippi and along came a uh, bullet that uh, shattered the uh, passenger window. Now, wow. it could have been just somebody deciding to, to, to shoot, but how many people go shoot at some a car coming up right. the highway? Now, I don't think it's a coincidence. Hey, Lolis, uh, you're an enormously interesting guy uh, for so many reasons. Uh, and I introduced you that way, <laughs> you missed it. <laughs> uh, but I am curious because in the film, one of the reasons you're there is because your father had a civil rights law firm. Uh, and I think he was, was one of three African-Americans. And so when I'm listening to what uh, we, Richard, we know went to jail, we'll talk about that. That was uh, Gary's lawyer. Uh, I did not know, but <laughs> Armand and his wife were shot at. I, I have to assume from everything I've learned that the that people, you know, the local clan, everyone knew the Ellie House. Mm -hmm. The Ellie House, I mean, this was the worst nightmare for, for I would think, the, you know, Southern, you know, gentility, right? There is an African-American law firm that actually defends African-Americans and they have a boy named Lolis going off to school. Let's mess with that kid. You know, it's not discussed in the movie, but I'm just assuming you, your father's career choice wasn't great for you. I'm laughing to hear you refer to it as a civil rights law firm, because in many ways it was that. But my father would say he was trying to earn a living as a lawyer <laughs> and uh, was both uh, was dragged into this and also very willingly joined in this fight that he saw as being so necessary. Um, mind you, I was very young at the time this was taking place. I was not even uh, uh, in double digits yet. So I knew nothing about this at the time it was taking place. My father mentions in the film that their offices were firebombed in New Orleans. But New Orleans was not as bad as Plaquemine, where Gary Duncan and Judd Perez had their run in. So as bad as things were in the city of New Orleans, and as bad as things indeed continue to be with regard to civil rights in the city of New Orleans, it was not the same as being and Bogalusa, it was a sense that it was possible to get something resembling rights. And in fact, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, the federal court in uh, set in New Orleans and some of the important civil rights decisions came out of that court. Yeah. So I don't wanna minimize the danger and the chances that my father took, but also I'm not certainly of the same caliber as I Gary Duncan did. So can you uh, explain, let me just say this. It was, there were yeah, two, go ahead, Armand. Two worlds down there, the two worlds the world of the people who lived there. And that's what it was like before the, the 60s when people started coming from outside. And the notion that people came from outside and people were watching, the newspapers were watching, the FBI was watching, um, congressmen were watching, that shining the light from outside made all the difference. But I'll just mention one thing, Lois's father, when he was testifying in the tri in a trial, um, testified about how one time he had gone to some rural parish in Louisiana, and during a break uh, around lunchtime, the judge called him over and said, um, you see that tree out there? Uh, we used that tree the last time a blank and lawyer stayed overnight. Lolas got the message and made sure he finished the trial by the end of the day. Yeah, wow. That was the part in the film about them driving back and the, the car was overheating. And yeah. Lola, his father says something like, we're not stopping in any gas station. Right. We are gonna just keep pressing on. We do not wanna be stopped here. Hey, Lola, this is this point that uh, Armand is making is interesting because uh, we're gonna talk about Richard in a moment, but Richard says in the movie that, you know, he really wanted, you know, a kind of, when he went down, he was sort of hoping for an appointment, you know, it was by accident that he ends up you know, defending one of the cases that goes to the Supreme Court. But at the time, people who were up north always kept in mind Birmingham and Selma and Montgomery. New Orleans, you know, although is the South, wasn't thought of in, in among at least Northerners. And I'm wondering whether that was also part of the appeal in Nancy's choice of this case 
uh, because we don't really think of you know, Louisiana as a place that was also very much part of the civil rights movement. Uh, you know, uh, Lois, you were for years a columnist for the Picayune, so you, maybe you can help us understand what this idea was that New Orleans was the Deep South, and yet it really wasn't really where Martin Luther King was protesting. Well, you really have to make a distinction between New Orleans and Louisiana. Ever ah. since the time of the American Purchase in 1803, Americans have been trying to impose a, a more American style of segregation and racism on New Orleans, where the, the racism of the French and the Spanish was very different. And that battle continued to be fought for, for decades, if not centuries. Um, so that makes a big difference. The other thing is that I began to realize that the places that are most famous in civil rights, for the most part, are the places that King went, which is Georgia and Alabama. I and see. they were, um, they were um, SCLC strongholds. Right. CORE was more in Louisiana. My father uh, was a long-term member of CORE, and I think was the head of Louisiana chapter of CORE. For, for people while. that don't remember, CORE stands for the Congress on Racial Equality. Exactly. So I stumbled onto something a moment ago when I said where King wasn't, you're saying. Exactly. I, I stumbled onto something that was a truth that people knew where King was. L I was hoping that maybe uh, Gary and Nancy, we, we, there's sort of a, unfortunately, Richard Sobel died, was it just a year ago? Uh, we could have had him this evening. It's a, it's a, it's a real shame. Um, you know, the movie, as much as it is about Gary, it's really also a Valentine, Nancy, to, uh, to Richard and his relationship to Gary and their brotherhood and, their, uh, and, their, and, and the, the commitment that they had, Richard's commitment to the family that continued for decades. Uh, at the one, you know, I, I found myself at the end of the film very tearful, uh, you know, when we saw them at the end and Richard looked so uh, weak and, and you can just see almost Gary holding him up. Um, just something so beautiful about that relationship. So Richard's not here. Uh, I think it's important, Nancy, for you to also talk when, when we're talking about Richard, we should talk about he, the fact that he was Jewish. <laughs> in the Deep South and a lawyer, the reason he was arrested was because he was Jewish and a white lawyer. Is that correct? Is that- Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Well, first let me just back up and say that your response to them um, is very heartening. They, to me, they that relationship is the heartbeat of the movie. I mean, yeah. there's so many other important themes in the movie, but that closeness that they had, that, that friendship they forged, did last a lifetime. And I know Gary is feels very, very strongly. I'm putting words in Gary's mouth right now, but I was very moved by the relationship that Gary had with Richard and vice versa. Um, and one of the, the joys of making the film was not only getting to know Richard, but also ultimately showing the film to Richard before he passed away. And Gary was there with me and the author of the book, Deep Delta Justice, which is one of the things that inspired me to make this movie. It's a beautiful book by Matt Van Meter. And we all watched the film together. And it was literally a month before Gary, before Richard passed away. And I, I understand from Richard's wife, Anne, that it was really one of his happiest days. So that that's one of the things that you know, a filmmaker can can really be gratified by. Um, but just getting back to the Jewish story and issue, and I think that actually Armin Durfner can speak to this as well as I can. Um, there's no question that a good majority of the lawyers who came down to the South during that period were Jewish and did feel a connection to the struggle. And, um, and we open up that conversation in the film. There is um, a reference to this and a discussion, not a long one, about how involved they were and whether or not they were, um, you know, what that commitment really meant. I don't want to get into it too much, but the one, one thing, you know, Richard said, and he, Richard was not a, a, a strongly observant Jew, but he did feel strongly about the fact that the Holocaust had happened just two decades before. Right. And that there was no question that there would be lingering feeling and um, and commitment as a result of having gone through the Holocaust, that there was definitely a connection. So it's not just a coincidence that a good percentage of the lawyers who came down during Freedom Summer and then the following summer where this story takes place um, were, were Jewish. Um, and Gary, you, I, I, uh, 
I would I would assume had it not been for the the you know unhappy accident of you being a good Samaritan stopping your car to check on your cousin and your nephew you were yourself only a teenager at the time had you not done that this brotherly relationship with a Jewish lawyer probably would never have happened right a person who was so important in your life it's just to me it's such so it's it's romantic I'm sorry <laughs> it's a romantic idea right that that's something that you would not have had in your life am I right exactly uh Jeff if it wasn't the, and the, the case in the case and just ex, uh, exposed me so and Mr. Sobo he was a uh, he involved me in everything that he did with the case for the for the five years you know even with my case his case you know uh, I was involved in all of it I wasn't uh, just a uh, stay home and he called me on the phone and, but he would, hey, if something was going on in the courthouse, he wanted me there and we, we communicated. And uh, yeah. so, and he was, he was so brilliant and, and, and he was so positive about things, you know, and it just, it just overwhelmed me about a lot of things that he did. So, yeah. And, and my family, they, they absorbed what was going on and uh, they took a, a, a like of time. And, you know, even after the case and everything, you know, we was always involved with each other. Yeah. Uh, so for, for an entire lifetime friendship, I, right. I didn't even, it didn't even occur to me now until I was listening to you now, uh, Gary, that, that Richard really wasn't even that much older than you, right, Armand, oh, yeah. right? Because he was just out of law school, right? I mean, <laughs> they were both very young men, right? Right. You, yeah, ten years. Of, he was ten years older than me. Yeah, they were just right. so. So, given what, given what Nancy and Gary uh, said, given what Gary says in the film repeatedly, uh, I was hoping that maybe Armand, and given the fact that Nancy wanted to throw this back to Armand anyway, I was hoping that Armand and Lolis would talk about. I think that we're living in a time where the, we just have no sense of history at all. And so I, we did an event a number of years ago about a feature film called Marshall, which starred uh, 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 Chaswick Bozeman as a, a young Thurgood Marshall. And we had the entire cast. We were the New York premiere. So we had the entire cast. We had uh, Sterling K. Brown. We had Chadwick Bozeman. We had uh, Josh Gad, we had Kate Hudson, and we had the director, Reginald uh, Hrold, I think his last name is. And uh, at, that's a buddy story between a young Jewish lawyer uh, and a young Thurgood Marshall who prosecuted, who defend a, a, a civil rights case together. And I remember saying this then, and I'm gonna say it now, I hope Armand and Lolas could speak to this, which is that, there was an enormous, and Nancy just said it, there was a sense of solidarity and an alliance between Jews and African-Americans throughout the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. And so when Nancy Bursky says, the majority of the Jews who came down were Jews who came to the deep South and maybe also got shot at like Armand and his wife. Uh, today, that is just not how African-Americans especially those who are active in the social justice movement. You know, this is a perfect time to show this movie, to talk about this movie. We're living in a time where there's renewed consciousness about racial injustice, social justice, police brutality, uh, white supremacy. We're hearing about it every day, but the alliance just is not there. And in fact, there's almost an antagonism. I'm wondering whether, you know, Armand, we'll start with you and then Lolis, whether you see, you see that with a lament, with some sense of how did that happen? Well, I, I do, I do. And first of all, Nancy's exactly right that um, Jews were a large number of the people who came south. I'm Jewish. Um, there was a sense, I think, of social justice. Other people, of course, also came, came down. A lot of them were all, a lot of the lawyers that came down, they weren't Jewish, did have religious backgrounds. 
or felt religious zeal. But in my case, um, I was born in France and uh, we came to this country when I was two years old in 1940. We left Paris uh, the night that Hitler came in. And my parents taught me when I was growing up about oppression, discrimination, um, and the terrible things that one group of people can do to another. And so when we came to this country and we saw the same, some of the same thing going on, not quite concentration camps, but the same kind of thing, uh, it was almost an, an instinctive reaction. Uh, what's happened in recent years is a different story. And obviously a lot of it is a, is a political story. It has to do with the state of Israel and issues in the Middle East. But I will say this, that uh, you're, you're right about many African-Americans, but I know a lot of African-Americans, especially older people who do remember the old days with whom we did form bonds and the bonds have stayed in many cases as strong as they ever were. Well, but, but yes, exactly, because there are people like Gary. I, I wonder, I'm gonna get to Lola's in a second, but maybe we should just go back to Gary for a second. I don't know how, if you've been following that, Gary, but there does seem to be a, a sort of a new antagonism and Jews are just not perceived as once being a persecuted group. The, what, what Nancy said about you know, the, this case being 20 years after the Holocaust, you know, most people today don't even know what the Holocaust is. You know, people that are involved you know, heavily in the Black Lives Matter movement, they don't make those associations. And I'm wondering whether you think, Gary, when if you're aware of this, you think, this is ridiculous. One of my best friends is a guy named Richard Sobel. And this is all based, you know, my whole life was changed because of this relationship. Yes, I have no doubt that Gary's generation knows this, but I'm wondering whether maybe Gary and Lolis can speak to how did it come about that that disappeared? Either one of you. Um. Well, what I would say is that the issues are a bit more complicated now. Mm -hmm. All reasonable people can agree that folks shouldn't have been lynched, that there should be justice by trial and jury, et cetera, and not by, by mob justice. Most people agree that there shouldn't be segregation signs, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, one of my father's other Jewish friends from the movement, uh, the, why am I forgetting, it's Jeremiah Gutman. Wait, he was, he was from New Orleans? He was a Louisiana no, no. Jewish? Jeremiah oh, Gutman was from New York. Oh, I see. He also, he also came down like Armand? Right. Uh, yeah, but what I remember is when I interviewed him in New York decades later, he talked about going to Florida on vacation and seeing signs saying, no niggers, dogs, gypsies, or Jews. When the problems were so stark and so clear, all reasonable people could more easily get on the same side and agree that the first thing we need to do is ensure that we have democracy in all 50 states, that the constitution applies to all 50 states. We move forward and get to issues like affirmative action, like Israel, like other places, including South Africa, for example, then it gets more complicated and there can be legitimate grounds for disagreement. If you add to that someone like Louis Farrakhan, whose issues, who takes his Islamic issues and brings them into the American Jewish black relationship in a way that uh, was not illuminating or helpful. But all of those. Well, I mean, they're, they're also, Lois, they're, an, it, you know, avowedly anti Semitic. Exactly. Right. I mean, but so you find yourself, okay, I agree with, with Farrakhan and X, Y, and Z. Do you then slide on the slippery slope into anti Semitism or not? And what I'd say is a whole lot of people did indeed slide into that. Additionally, you get the complication. But of, wait, I'm sorry. Would it change? If more people saw this film, would you think that a, a generation of people who are not aware of this history at all would see this film and say, you know, I, I, that was a Jewish guy. <laughs> and they were, you know. I would, hope, um, I, would, I would hope that it would change. You know, uh, I, I know a little bit about the Holocaust and uh, uh, I know a little bit about Farrakhan, uh, but I had, my mother, mother, her name was Alexandrine Jones. Uh, she was a, a, I don't know how would you say it. She, she really was a, 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 a racist. A, 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 what? A, a, she was a fighter for against this racist, mm -hmm. and uh, she, 
she was a very, very strong woman. And, and I think that's where a lot of my mother genes come from. And uh, none of my family, I, 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 I never did see any fear in none of my family. And, and when Mr. Sobel came and we talked and he was scared, but he never did show his fear. So uh, that's yeah. one thing I like. I really like liked it about him, you know. And uh, but I really do hope this year would change the whole look outlook of of, of a lot of racist thing that that's going on yeah. in this country, you know. Uh, could be, and, and 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 right up to this day, there's a lot of things that I see on television that I I really don't understand. I really do not understand about some of these politicians. Yeah, well, we're gonna, I want to get to that in a second. I'm going to come back to you on this very point. So, Lolas, maybe you can finish up and, and, and address that even question I asked both of you again, which is, do you think the film, because I think that there is a widespread ignorance about this. When we did that night with Marshall, I was surprised that we did it live, but I was surprised that the audience was a, was a younger group and they, I think they were thrown by this sort of, it was a buddy movie. You know, if you remember that film, it was this mm -hmm. interesting buddy film, mm -hmm. a young Thurgood Marshall, uh, you know, and, and a young, you know, Jewish real estate lawyer in Connecticut, you know, come together to defend a, a falsely accused African-American chauffeur. Mm -hmm. So anyway, go ahead, uh, Lola, well, help us understand the politics of this. The film is emotionally powerful. And I would hope that people would be moved by it. But I think the question of any kind of Black Jewish coalition has to be discussed in the present tense, has to be discussed, for example, in the context of Black Lives Matter. And so for young people to say, OK, that was then, this is now, in this case, despite the fact that I have no, no patience with people who lack an interest or knowledge of the history, I think really, the question really is, what's going on now? Also be very careful because when we talk about these coalitions, people like my father and Richard Sobel and Gary Duncan are the exceptions. It's not like they got a whole lot of black lawyers looking for a whole lot of Jewish lawyers to bond with. A whole lot of lawyers of both races are chasing ambulances or other equivalents <laughs> of different kinds of, of fields. Right. So uh -huh. make no, we're talking about exceptional human beings. Yeah. They don't, you know, they, they, we got, you know, uh, a black man, a, a Jewish man and two black men involved in this film. But more importantly than their race and religion is the fact that they were exceptional human beings, the likes of which we see all too seldom. So, uh, can, I jump in, can I jump in? Uh, yes, saying please, on this as well? Nancy. Um, I think one of the things that we should remember, I, I think Lois is making a good point that we don't want to oversimplify on and overgeneralize what's going on. Um, he also made a point in the in the film. He says this in the film. We're that talking about thinking, Richard Nancy. I'm talking about Lola saying this about Jewish oh, lawyers. Okay. Um, that there are things that Jews could do in the South that black lawyers or black people yeah. could never think of doing just by right. dint of their skin color. But I think it's also important to remember that there were people like Leander Perez, and his name hasn't come up very much. Yeah, I'm about to get there. It's funny. It's very I was just important about to remember that we had white supremacists who were driving this um, this plot if you want. And they were threatened by Jews who were extremely well organized. Now blacks were organized, black people were organized as well. Um, he liked to characterize black people as not being well organized. That wasn't true. The NAACP was thriving during that period. Um, but he loved to pin it on the Jews and make it seem as if they were coming down with their superior organizational skills and they were ruining it for everybody because uh, they were trying to change that. So that was his, his, his kind of advertising. Yeah. Um, and he used, and that's why he arrested Richard Sobel, you right. know, because he represented that. He wanted to send a message. So, so Armand, take us through that, uh, that arrest, because I think that's important that the audience know. There was a second case, and that was a case that was not involving uh, uh, Gary, but involved a case, a civil suit, brought by Richard because he was imprisoned essentially for doing his job. Uh, he was imprisoned by this, you know, what, what can you call him? He's like a, a chieftain, a warlord, uh, you know, Lander Perez. And was, of course it turned out. But was that, yeah, like an emperor of that, of that <laughs> region. Of, and, and, and so that case ended up 
uh, being equally important in a different way, right? Because the efforts by uh, Southern you know, uh, officials to disrupt uh, the, the machinery, the new workings of the civil rights movement through the Civil Rights Act and public accommodations and the Voting Rights Act and uh, fair employment and housing, uh, you know, that these guys that were interfering with that now all of a sudden would be subject to either criminality or civil liability. That's what that case, can you take us through that briefly? The, the, the old Southern regime operated and succeeded so well because there was no outside light being shined on it. And a lot of that outside light was lawyers and newspapers, so, and the NAACP. So the Southerners like Leander Perez, their main job was to keep the light out. And um, so when Sobel was arrested, it was not simply an arrest of him, it was a threat to, to try to show that no outside lawyers could come in uh, and disrupt their way of life. Because By the way, were other lawyers arrested? That's not clear. I was. I was. You were, okay. I was arrested in Holly Springs, Mississippi, in the middle, standing in the middle of the courtroom one day after Dick Sobel's arrest, um, about a year, la year, year later, um, when I was arrested, the deputy sheriff motioned me over. I went over. I said, were you pointing to me? He said, yes. I said, he said, you're under arrest. I said, did, does, does the judge know about this? He said, the judge is who told me to arrest you. <laughs> uh, the point is, if, if Richard Sobel, if one lawyer can be arrested from, out, from the outside world, and it really is like the outside world, then every lawyer can be arrested and they can keep us out, just like the big per, um, uh, 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 defamation case, the big libel case against the New York Times. They also wanted the newspapers out. They wanted the TV stations out. That's why in Little Rock, the crowd beat up reporters. So they wanted the outside light out. And Dick Sobel, um, LCDC brought uh, a federal case to argue that Dick Sobel couldn't be arrested, that outside lawyers who were simply uh, doing con representing constitutional claims of African-Americans and some white allies um, had a right to be there because if they weren't there, if we weren't there, um, the constitution would be ignored, violated every day. Um, Gary Duncan, if, if Dick Sobel hadn't been there that day, uh, we may say, Gary, that was a, this is an, um, an odd incident and Gary could have gotten out of it. I guarantee you, if Dick, if that, had, if that hadn't happened, Gary might have pled and made a deal that day, given the kind of personality he is, which is simply saying, I want to know why things are this way. He would have spent, he would have found, they would have found some way to put Gary Duncan in prison and keep him there. He'd be in, in Angola today. Wow. Not just yeah. of that incident. So the point wow. was, he, the, the lawyers had to be arrested because lawyers were shining the light. And yes, but, the, but the case that Richard brought, the LCDC brought, ended up changing the law, right? I mean, right. in other words, it, it ended right. up, it ended up blinding that light. I mean, in other words, the, the, lawyers the, out. Right. The thing, the thing, the thing about it is that Perez, he arrested Mr. Sobel to think and discourage other lawyers. Right, and exactly. Before Mr. Sobel took this case, uh, Mr. Sobel and uh, Colin Douglas and Eli, they had a conference about taking this case because Perez had a reputation that that uh, he didn't allow no outside lawyers coming in Louisiana, which he had ran uh, lawyers out of the out of the parish already. So you had that reputation. And uh, Mr. Sobel and uh, Mr. Lyon, and Douglas, and, and, and Neil, they uh, they talked about this, and they decided, to say, well, hey, well, yeah, we're gonna take the case, and uh, and that's what they did. Yeah, but 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 I just want to just be clear that the 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 case, the second case, the one that was brought uh, by uh, Richard, ended up. Did it put an end? Because it yeah. sounds like what you've described, Armand is that this was being done to, you know, to, to, to shut the light on lawyers right. and shut the light on the press. Just I understand that, but what I'm trying to understand is Richard not only defended Gary, but the case that he brought against Perez 
ended up making it easier for lawyers going forward to represent uh, civil rights activists and demonstrators without fear that they're going to go to jail. Is that correct? Right. Or not? It, not, exactly. not easier, possible. In other words, uh, that case ended up in an injunction against the state of Louisiana to say they could not pro they could not keep Dick Sobel out. And when I got arrested in Holly Springs, um, uh, we we said to the local prosecutor, the, the the federal court has already told Louisiana they can't keep lawyers out. You want to go through the same thing? The federal court here will tell you the same thing. And yeah. The case. So it was it was essentially precedent. Yeah. Um, Lola, let me to give you. Let me start with you on this one. This is the tough question. This is the, the, we're at the money round. <laughs> um, you can't help but watch this movie as a celebration of just a friendship, but also the racial justice that was occurring and the spirit of it that was occurring during that time. When you think of Black Lives Matter today, and we know that this is you know the resurgence of interest in racial justice, racial equality, racial equity. Do you see a straight line between this movement that Nancy captured and the movement that we're in? Do you see, and I'm gonna ask this question in a way because I'm, I'm among those that are somewhat troubled by you know, the comparisons in some ways. Like I, to me, you know, Gary is a, a hero. Uh, Bayard Rustin to me is really literally one of my favorite all-time Americans. Like I, if you tell me on a normal day, they name your top five, I will always say Bayard Rustin to me is, you know, when I think of, you know, at the African-Americans that I, I would say worshiped, you know, in the 1960s, you know, uh, James Baldwin, people that Richard Wright, this, this was important to me. I don't make this connection with Jacob Blake, for instance, you know, I don't make this connection, even though we're being told to make the connection. And I just don't see, you know, uh, uh, you know th this struggle looking to me like the struggle that we saw with Richard and Gary. Is that a, just a, a, a weird white perspective that I just offered? Or is there something to that that you even understand because of your dad and because of your relationship with Richard and Armand? There's some other things about this country you have to understand to put this in context. In addition to the stark racial implications of the civil rights movement, there's a regional implication to it as well, where Northern whites were saying to black people in the South or to white people in the South that you can't do things that way. When the civil rights movement and the black power movement moved to the North, they did not find a whole lot of difference between the white people in the North and the white people in the South which is to say the issue of race remains America's unfinished business. And as the, as the questions become more complicated, we find many of our allies are less inclined to be in alliance with us. Having said that, I see, for example, Black Lives Matter signs in places I wouldn't expect them to be. There's an organization called, I believe, Southern, ba Southern Bakers for Racial Reconciliation, which is mostly white Southerners attempting to use their skills as bakers and chefs to raise money for causes that they support. There, is always, there are always people who are willing to sacrifice and to stand on the side of right. But I believe because we're so distant from the civil rights movement, because Martin Luther King is dead, it becomes very easy for people to say, well, I, I supported that or I would have supported that. I don't support this. But let's look at what happens now. Let's look at the clear evidence of racial uh, injustice now. The most obvious example of me is the fact that these Capitol rioters were, labeled, were able to leave Washington without being killed. And had they been black, they would have been yeah. killed. So my point is that things have changed, but to look back on these old cases and these old people whose demands may have been more reasonable in part because of the times, I think is to engage in a kind of nostalgia which huh. um, is interesting, but hardly relevant for the present sense. Hmm. Well, let me, let me say Anyone want to answer that? Because that was very well said, Lois. Thank yeah, you. So let, me, let me add on to that. Um, I, I think when you say you don't see a straight line, or do you see a straight line? Um, I see a line. It may not be straight. This country had 
12 generations, 300 years times, say, let's say 25 years of generation, 12 generations of slavery and Jim Crow, and 12 generations of nailing in that concept, and really in the whole country, not just the South. So that official Jim Crow ended in the 1960s with the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act. So we really have had only two generations to overcome that. Well, you don't build Rome in a day. You don't change 12 generations in two generations. I think we have made a lot of progress and a good friend of mine, a, um, a black a federal judge who was a, a civil rights lawyer and now had, now he's dead now, but he now has the federal courthouse in Columbia named after him. Uh, we had lunch one day and he said, I have seen things happen that I never dreamed I would live to see. So nothing moves, history doesn't move in a straight line. But, but we're, we have made progress, but we have a lot more to go. But we're not talking about it like that, right? I mean, if you, want, if you listen to the public discourse, we are being told our own president uses the word white supremacy all the time or systemic racism, right? I mean, I'm, I'm a longtime law professor. So I, 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 I don't, I think about the 13th, 14th and 15th amendment and the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act and all these other federal regulations when it comes to housing and, and desegregation and, and employment. And I don't see, you know, I don't see systemic in that way. Uh, you know, I wonder when I look at when I when um, what was the actor? I mean, I'm not I normally would not quote an actor, but I was just so up, appalled when the actor Kevin Hart said it's never been worse. Racism has never been worse in the United States. And I think, does Gary Duncan think that? <laughs> does does Gary really think that? Does Lolas really? And I'm not asking you, Lolas, to take your take your cues from Kevin Hart, but I'm just saying, I want to think, I see something else and I don't think it's the same. And so I'm, I, that's why I'm saying that, yes, it's only, it's two generations later, but it seems like we're not allowed to talk about the extraordinary progress. I voted for a black man twice, you know, for president. And you know what, let me point this out. I voted for a black man twice for president when I lived in Harlem. I just want, should I repeat that? Because I well, love that I can well, say that. On. You mentioned the Voting Rights Act. Yeah. Look at what's happening in much of the country now with regard to voting rights, which would suggest that we had a temporary victory and not one that was lasting or substantial. Something else you'd need to be very clear on. I, I remember having a discussion about the Black Power Movement because among people like Stanley Crouch were saying that after the, we had this great uh, fellowship of the civil rights movement, then the Black Power Movement basically kicks all the white people out. Yeah. Part of what the Black Power Movement was saying is that Black people started this movement with the Montgomery bus boycott and other things that white people were not involved in. We started this movement and white people can join this movement on our terms. A lot of those white people coming from the North were convinced that they should be leaders because they were white and Black people should follow because they were Black. So look, man, you know, I lived in Harlem too. Don't be thinking that all these white people came down that wasn't racist. Don't yeah. believe that for a minute. And we'll begin to find as black people are attempting to define an agenda for ourselves that only some white people are interested in. Well, you know, it's funny, it, Nancy didn't say this, but Lois just reminded me of it. If when people talk about the rift between African-Americans and Jews, in the night, even in the late 1960s, early 70s, you were hearing language that said, well, the African American, you know, we feel that Jews are being paternalistic and they're, you know, they're, they're in charge of our lives. And isn't it great that they help us, you know, because what God forbid, what, without them, where would we be? And I think that there was talk for years about when the rift started to unfold, there was some of that, which was that. You know, I think I think you mentioned it in, implicitly, Lois, but I wanted to open it up a little because I think that that is an argument that had been made that that there was a different that relationship was you know it wasn't only the way just Gary and, and Dick had it. Well, wait, uh, saying uh, even Richard Sobel, while he was there, would say that he was 
you know, it was, he was, it was great that everybody was coming together and working together, but it didn't mean that black people had to follow what white people were, were doing. Oh, I love he that. Made it very clear. And we, we repeated that, that uh, statement in the movie because it was so important to him that as much as he saw, he was in a, he was there to assist not to take over. Which is why not every, white, not, every, but not every white lawyer felt that way. There were many white people that did come down and think that they had a right to yeah. tell people what to do. So but, these things are very complicated. And one of the dangers I think in in my film, and I and I, I, I care enormously about this, is that we don't oversimplify and that this film isn't a cause for nostalgia, that this film opens up conversation and sparks kind of conversation we're having today. But as as good as things may have or as as, as improved as things may have appeared then, it still wasn't that simple. And you know, I, I just feel like what what Lolis is saying is is incredibly important that Black Lives Matter is a whole other animal. It's another thing. I mean, you can't compare a hero who it, like Bayard Rustin, who is an intellectual and, and, and a very important person with someone who's just been shot in the back. You know, um, that's going to elicit different reactions to people and it should. So I, I think that these things are so complex and so different that I, I just, I, I hope our film is not going to be used to oversimplify things, but to let us have the conversation. And to reinforce what you just said, Nancy, Gary said earlier, and it was very well appreciated when he said, I think it's important to know that Richard always explained what was happening and included me as if I was participating in my defense. And I think that that, I bet Lolis would say, that's not true of every lawyer. I bet Armand would say some lawyers never came down and you know discussed anything. They said we got it. Sit down and we'll talk for you. And well, we got your back. Uh, let you know. Let me just say this: that is a lawyer's occupational disease. All lawyers <laughs> are the notion that we're in charge. And yeah. Frank, one of the things that I treasure in my life, and I'm sure Dick treasured in his life was learning that we were not in charge, that we were technicians there to do a job. Uh, my guess is, and I know the firm Richard worked, worked for, and we were good friends in Washington. He started, I guarantee you, with the same notion that lawyers in charge. What we quickly learned in the South of those days, in the Black communities, that we frankly felt enveloped and warmed by was that we were not in charge, but it's something you have to learn. Yeah. Something that's implicit in the film, but not dealt with uh, on an ongoing way, is the way in which the ways in which Richard Sobel certainly changed by being in, in Louisiana. His decision to stay was a clear indication of him changing. But I right, think we forgot to ways, mention that, right? That point that Richard was unusual. He didn't do this as a three week vacation. He ended up staying and practicing in Louisiana and in DC. That's important, right? That Armand, I assume there were, weren't many, right? It was the same pattern that I followed. We went down and we caught a disease there, the disease of wanting to be um, helping the people that we met, falling in love with the, with, with the people we met and wanting to go back. And so Dick went back and became a full-time staff lawyer and stayed there for several years. In New Orleans, I did the same thing in, in Mississippi. Yeah. Hey, Lo, let's go back to what you were going to say before, and then we'll go to Gary. You were just finishing up. Well, yeah, I was only saying that the film sort of looks at Richard Pryor as a complete man. But at the time, Richard Sobel, 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 Sobel. Richard Sobel, Lord <laughs> Richard Sobel as a complete man. But of course, he was changing during the course of these events. Yeah. And so we had no choice. But to look back on it as if, uh, and, and not necessarily know all the steps that uh, led him to become who he ultimately became. Before, uh, Gary, before we get to you, I just wanna add something about, the, we raised this very complicated question about Jews and African-Americans and Jewish lawyers and African-Americans and you know, the sense of, uh, you know, the sense of uh, cooperation as opposed to paternalism. But I think one of the interesting anecdotes that even today is hard to imagine, which is that when Thurgood Marshall left the, Legal Defense Fund uh, to become a federal judge when uh, Lyndon Johnson appointed him, uh, the, the torch was handed to Jack Greenberg, his deputy, who was a, a Jewish lawyer. And you know, over years, he stayed in that position for 30 years. 
Believe me, African Americans question that. Why is a Jewish lawyer running the Legal Defense Fund? That, you know, but I just think that that's that to me is always an interesting anecdote, right? That Thurgood, on his way out the door, handed it to Jack, and at clearly and at least in those days, there wasn't that feeling. There must have not been that sense of this is our struggle. It's not your struggle, and back off. we we got it from here. I don't know if you knew that anecdote, Lois, but I always I, I try to remind people sometimes uh, because it is unusual. I think Gary, you were about to say something. Yeah, well, maybe uh, this Jewish lawyer that uh, Elgo Marshall left in his place was like Mr. Sober. Mr. Sober got involved with civil rights even before he came to New Orleans. Yeah, uh, when he heard about it, he got involved with it, and he. he, he he, wrote, he really wanted to, to do it. What he was doing, he done everything from his heart. He didn't do it for you no know, prestige, for uh, where he could just be recognized in which he had a lot of lawyers that did come to the yeah. South just to be recognized for their, for their uh, prestige. But Mr. Sober was in that kind. Everything he did, he did it out of his heart. That, he did that, it willingly. This is what he wanted to do. This, this, and, and I look at, at Mr. Sobel uh, and for the, what I know about him and the way me and him are told, you know, this man was born for what he did. Huh. He was born for that. You know, he, he's uh, a God sent man for this. That was his point was to do just what he did. Yeah, I got to say, I cannot think of a better way to end this evening with Gary's voice and talking about Richard. That just was really very moving and beautiful. Before we say good night to everybody, let me just say we have some closing remarks. I think we have some either upcoming events or something. Let's see, what do we got? Oh yes, of course, our international short film competition. We're, we're seeking, uh, accepting submissions. This is one of our favorite things. This is our, I think our ninth year is coming up. Uh, these are films from all over the world, 20 minutes or less dealing with racial justice, social justice, human rights. Uh, they come from all over the world. Last year, we had films from Iran, and South Korea and Cyprus, uh, and of course, you know, Western countries and the United States. So, uh, and it's for young filmmakers and old filmmakers, and we give out the Folksy Award, uh, and we've got all new surprises coming up this year and new presenters. So uh, keep that in mind. Let's see, do we have anything else coming up? Uh, Folks hasn't charged any tickets since the pandemic. We went virtual. Um, you know, we're very proud of the programming that we've done for the last 16 months. Uh, tonight was a really good example of folks on display of what folks can do. Uh, and so this is also a good time to, you know, donate and to, uh, to your cultural institutions. So please keep us in mind. Uh, Nancy, this is a great movie. Uh, congratulations. Uh, uh, you know, Gary, you're a treasure. And I, I, this without having you tonight, that would have not been the same. And I'm so happy that you made yourself available. I think you, you had a fishing gig, but you came to us instead. So Gary, please know we're very, very, very honored that you shared this and we're gonna blast this, 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 uh, this hour of talk will live on forever because we will continue to blast this. So thank you, well, Gary. Well, I wanna thank God for uh, Alan Douglas and Eli, Mr. Sobel, I, I thank God for for Nancy and everybody that's been involved in, in this here, in this, and I don't consider myself a hero. I just hope and trust God that that uh, something good come out of this. And yeah. uh, I don't, I'm not looking for no recognition. Well, and, you you and you already I, said that Richard didn't, and neither did you. <laughs> and if and if I was a young young a young man coming up, I would be. Uh, I be I would be marching also right now for the blacks right and uh I, I think that the blacks ain't got a little bit too much comfortable uh or or should I say relaxed because there's a lot there's a lot of work still to, to be done yeah. uh the systematic racism is is here is here today and uh, uh, and they're gonna be here for a while. I mean, we, we can't change the world overnight because then 
it would be a chaos if that would happen. But uh, <laughs> I, I appreciate all y'all. And I thank you, Nancy. I thank all for all y'all. Thank you. So, Ar 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 thank you. Armand, I should say that, you know, you were somewhat the unsung hero of tonight. Uh, because you 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 rent you represented a generation of lawyers that could have stayed back and you know worked on antitrust cases and corporate cases and instead you were you know as you said there was you you caught you caught the fever uh, and you went down but most lawyers young lawyers didn't and so you know I think it's I know you have a new book coming I think you have a new book out uh, so we should remember the book is just out justice deferred and I think it actually addresses this very thing, the service that was done on behalf of the Constitution by the young lawyers like you in the 1960s that dedicated themselves to representing civil rights workers and activists. Uh, and Lois, it was wonderful meeting you and you added an enormous amount to this evening um, on many, many levels. So good night to all of you. Uh, we'll see you again at Folks. Maybe we'll have you back as guests. My name is Thane Rosenbaum. Good night from folks. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.